Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is on the Green Constitution and Natural Resources. It's the 10th webinar in a series that we've been conducting here at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies on the new constitution in Chile. The, the series is called the Academic Forum for the New Constitution in Chile, and it's the initiative is led by Professor Stephen Levitsky, um, who many of you know, who's a professor in our government department here at Harvard, and who's the director of the David Rockefeller Center. My name is Forrest Reinhardt. I'm a professor at the business school at Harvard, and I'm also the faculty chair for the Andes and Southern Cone Committee of the David Rockefeller Center. It's been my honor to visit Chile a couple of times for research um, and to visit the David Rockefeller Center uh, <clears throat> research facility in Santiago, headed by the estimable Marcela Renteria. Um, and like most people in the whole hemisphere, I've recently become much more interested in constitutional issues, both because of what's happening in Chile and because of what's happening in my own country, the United States. Uh, this forum, this series of events brings together international scholars, practitioners, and academic leaders from Chile for a high quality, high caliber academic debate as Chile seeks to build a more inclusive more participatory and more responsive constitutional system. Normally, our audience at these seminars is a little more than half from Chile and the other half from all over the rest of the world, literally um, many, many, many countries represented. So today's webinar is about the green constitution and natural resources. Uh, it's clear that there aren't very many issues in the world that are more important than our relationship with the natural environment. Um, <clears throat> You think about air pollution, about the pollution of fresh water, about the degradation of marine systems, um, and of course about climate change. Um, and the question then arises, how are societies to protect their natural environments and what constitutional provisions make sense um, for that protection and to maintain um, those biological and physical systems? Um, and obviously the answers are arrived at at different points in time in different countries at different stages of economic development. In my own country, for example, the constitution, as you know, is a product of the late 18th century at a time when population densities were very low and technologies weren't very sophisticated. And the effects of human society on the environment were typically short-term and localized. And that none of those things is true today in Chile or the United States or practically anywhere else. Population densities are greater, uh, technologies are more sophisticated, our collective impact on the environment is proportionally greater. And so it makes sense that in Chile now, the architects of the new constitution need to be more explicit about the relationships between the constitutional system and the environment than James Madison and his colleagues were um, back in the 1780s. Um, now, so it, we, we tend, I think, to think of natural systems as being encased in these social systems that affect them. And so we think about the effect of mining firms on the environment, or we think about the effect of energy consumption on the environment. But it's important to remember that those social systems are actually embedded in a broader set of biological, chemical, and physical systems on whose functioning they depend for their own functioning. So it's really important that we get this right. Um, and the issue arises that there are people who advocate for rights of nature, that animals or ecosystems or oceans should have rights in themselves, just as people have rights in themselves. And that's a super interesting idea and one that I, get, I hope we'll get to explore. Um, but whether or not one subscribes to that view, the treatment of the environment by people has to be governed by human systems um, and by human decisions making um, systems, whether constitutional or in some other way. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. Our moderator today, we're super lucky to have him, is Christian Rodriguez Schiffel, who's um, a Chilean national. Um, his early degrees are from Universidad de Concepcion. His later degrees are from Harvard. He went to the law school here and he went to the 
Kennedy School of Government here. And I'm going to turn the mic over to him in just a second, and he's going to keep us on track. Um, before I turn that over, I have a few housekeeping issues to cover. Um, we're recording today's session, as you heard when you entered. It will be available on the Dr. Klaus YouTube channel shortly after the session, and we'll send a link to people who registered. Uh, second, as I mentioned, this is one in a quite long series of uh, constitutional webinars um, centered on Chile, and we hope that you will uh, we will attend others. We are going to put in the chat a series of um, sets of information about future events in this series, and we hope that you'll be able to come to those as well. Um, this webinar is intended to be participatory. We hope that you'll that, that you will be simulated to to ask questions. Uh, the chat function is disabled, but if you want to type your questions into the Q&A feature of this Zoom technology, um, the moderators will read them and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, finally, as you've probably already noticed, there is simultaneous translation available both in English and in Spanish. Uh, there's an interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you feel more comfortable following the discussion in one language or the other, rather than just allowing the individual participants to, um, to choose the language that you hear. If you want just to hear the webinar as it transpires, you can just select off on that interpretation button. Um, that's all the housekeeping I have. I have been really looking forward to this, um, this webinar. We have a great set of panelists um, to whom we are about to be introduced by our moderator, Christian. So Christian, over to you. Absolutely. Forrest, thank you very much for, for, for giving us really a, a fantastic introduction. You, you already touched upon some of the, you mentioned, for example, rights of nature. And you, you're, you're already touching upon, I think, a, a good part of the discussion that, that is coming forward. Uh, I'm going to switch to Spanish now. As, as you know, uh, you have simultaneous translation available, uh, all of you. So, so please uh, do that if you want to continue uh, hearing us hearing us in English. Así que, bueno, nuevamente, nos sean todos, todos, sean todos muy bienvenidos. So once again, we would like to welcome you all. We have uh, Professor Forrest Reinhardt uh, introducing this uh, panel and our 10th panel uh, uh, constitution, where we're looking for an academic support uh, to the constitution in Chile and also support and be able to export the discussion that is being held in Chile to the rest of the region in the United States. We have always been very happy to have that, um, have almost half of the audience from the United States and not only in Chile, and um, in other continents. We are focused on different areas in uh, the environmental areas, green constitution, natural resources. First, uh, what we had an opening, uh, the panel, we had a keynote from Maisa Rojas. She was committed to participate with us. She's with the president right now in an activity. And that took more than what she expected and uh, she is not able to attend. Uh, however, and in spite of all that, uh, we have an outstanding panel of speakers. This will be open and we have a, a great uh, opportunity to have uh, Jorge Joannes. And um, I will also introduce Dominique Hervé, Ricardo Irarraza, Vale, Veronica Delgado that will uh, comment for his presentation. So without further say, we would like to start the discussion with uh, Jorge Viñuales, and, um, founder and ex-director of the Cambridge Center for the Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance at the Cambridge University. I will not go through his long curriculum, However, I would like to say that um, most of you know that Jorge is one of the major authorities, academic authority in um, environmental uh, right, law, and um, he will present uh, the structure and change in the constitution. And uh, he has seen uh, how the process uh, has been 
started out in Chile and um, what has uh, happened in the green constitutions elsewhere. So without further say, Jorge, thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, he's about to become a father. And um, thank you so much for taking time for this. The microphone is yours. Thank you, Christian, and thank you to the organizers. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. I will try to share my screen now. You see my PowerPoint now? Good. What I wanted to talk about in these 10 or 12 minutes of the presentation, uh, we have two items and in these two items, what we have uh, is the framework and the structural framework of ecological constitutionalism. It is very difficult to get to know how to structure an ecologic constitution and then developing certain details. So the focus, the plane, the structure, what has to be introduced in the constitution, what should not be introduced in the constitution and how to do that is more complex much more complex than simply choosing certain clauses or trying to develop uh, language. And uh, this is something that has been tried uh, to do. And uh, of course, we need to consider the uh, compared um, uh, the, the practical part and the constitutional uh, project in Chile, where the audience is no, uh, even more than uh, myself. So what I would like to present now, I would like to structure it in three steps. The first step will be very simple in the context of the Constitutional Assembly and the um, green constitutionalism within the Assembly. And then I will go to the main subject in the presentation. And at the end, I will open up uh, some perspectives on how uh, or what are the components that should be part of a green constitution, at least uh, from the point of view of the state of the art constitution. Now, going to the structure, going to the structure of what we should do and going to the general context that we are developing, as you all know, we have had many, many proposals for the inclusion of the constitutional project. And then we have been talking about that since 2020 in Chile. And uh, we are mentioning a number of elements that have been pointed out and have been proposed. They have been also been debated and um, by the plenary session. And uh, that touches not only a number of fields in environmental uh, rights or environmental law, but um, also environmental uh, rights that have um, a, a place um, in, in the constitution. And some of these elements are, don't need to be there. So what we are going to do is to structure these elements and compare them. This is the main objective of my presentation. As you see here, we have tried to reduce the uh, major structuring areas. And we want to do that in three elements. The first element is the uh, constitutional experience, compare constitutional experience, deepening into the compare constitutional experience. And you are able to see in further detail the concepts and the models and sustainable development that could be uh, there in the constitution. And deepening that and um, deepening into the relationship of uh, economy, social, and environment within the diverse models that we can find, there is a fundamental uh, element, which is um, international law. And um, whether we mention it or not, it's always there. And uh, we'll start with the um, compare constitutional experience. This is a bit complex. This is a bit complex. And what we need to do is to take the necessary time to analyze it. When we think about a juridical and environmental system, and we have some projects that are compared environmental projects and uh, from different areas, 
And when we try to summarize, when we try to summarize an environmental juridical system, there are three main elements. First, competency distribution. And that is a constitutional norm and that has an important role, it plays an important role as well as internal legislation. Then we have the structuring of the content. Internal legislation is very important. Constitutional uh, norm is important. However, it is a base, it's a base and we will analyze that, a juridical base. And then we have the uh, structure of the implementation system. And that is once uh, they have, we have the constitutional norm, internal legislation, it's uh, present and constitutional norm can play a fundamental role in terms of structure. Specifically, if there is a forum, an environmental forum, and or if the regulators, they have a constitutional base, they could be modifiable or should be modifiable in certain steps uh, that weakens the environmental message. I will take from each of these points, I will go into deep on each of these points and we will see how, how what are the aspects that have played a fundamental role. Now, we should mention, we should mention that and to focus, to put focus on this subject, is that in the states that have been analyzed in the juridical systems, there are many states, there are many federal states that have constitutions that do not mention environmental issue. The case of the United States uh, and other countries, and these Australia is another important case. In these cases, Environmental issues, as well as the European Union for so many years until 1986, in these cases, constitutional basis that um, um, have systems, environmental juridical systems that were very important, had diverse base. What were they? Well, there are three or four that are very important and are still very important, even though when a constitution has an explicit environmental competency. It is explicit because it creates interactions and they could be dominant for certain instruments. What are those bases? Well, fundamentally, energy, mining. However, uh, internal market is also an issue. It's an issue that has been very important in the development of the environmental affairs. The Commerce Clause uh, in the constitution uh, has been widely used in Australia and Canada, has also been widely used. And the other fundamental base, which uh, fundamental base, even though we have an explicit base on that, is the foreign affairs. And in foreign affairs, foreign affairs, it could go into the framework of a commission, commission number five of the Constitutional Assembly, or it might also be part of another commission and um, there should be a close relationship between this area and the environmental area. And why is that? Because it is referring to the international treaties, integration and international law. And this is fundamental. It has been used in the United States and Canada and Australia in many, many states where they do not have this explicitly uh, written. And this is just to change the constitutional balance between federal entities and national government. So the simple point here, the simple point that I would like to point out here in this context is that through the constitutional norm, it is important to have not only in the environmental base explicit in constitution, but in other bases that are not environmental bases and they could have a fundamental impact and in the environmental uh, area, there needs to be an explicit base. Regarding the content, the constitutional uh, norm or standards play, plays a role there. Uh, France is um, one of the most important elements for thought and the Chilean point of view, because in France, there is a constitutional there is a constitution since 2005 that considers these elements and it 
one of the few states in the world that has developed this type of constitution, environmental constitution within the constitution. They have done it in a very peculiar way and within the constitutional law, French constitutional law. However, it is a very good guide because it has a number of elements. And the most important thing is on the on content, what to put there, what not to put there, and um, a map of, of the size of a city is less useful than a small map. A constitution needs to be as a small map. A constitution needs to capture the essential and leave the rest for common um, for uh, legislation for the for for the. Uh, interpretation and um, there are many constitutions so what we need to do is sort of a cherry picking and try to summarize and see what these constitutions include as a foundational element and what you see in certain ways it reflects certain aspects that have also already being included in the plenary session of the constitution environmental issues are key and substantial and procedural they're, they're they're all important there is a sort of an ontology and a way of cutting and seeing what are the principles that might lead to confusion beyond clarifying what this could do what environmental principles need to be there they need to be there. They're part of different constitution. Individual rights are fundamental. I am not aware of um, environmental rights. And however, I think this is fundamental. It's fundamental and it has been analyzed and it is in different constitutions. Individual rights. Individual rights should be collective rights, substantial, pro procedural. And uh, we have not clarified in this area what are these rights for nature, uh, people, collective, um, and individual. So we need to talk about that. There are different constitutional practices in this. In a, a more reliable way at least a constitutional uh, right individual and substantial and transcendental which is a environmental democracy on the three rights and as christian was saying um the ministers um, attending a meeting in the escasu um agreement and that is environmental democracy and in France, this is part of the uh, World uh, Agreement on the Environment, and that has been used in uh, litigation, is the is something that might be considered weak, which is general, that the due diligence, the general due diligence, which could be applied to different uh, subjects, state, um, a non-state uh, or non-governmental, governmental or non-governmental, that is. And in this case, what they, we need to do is to concentrate on areas where it should not, uh, could, but uh, should legislate based on what constitution needs. In the United States, there are certain laws that are important at a federal level. They have been adopted in term, based on common laws, uh, the common laws, because uh, it's not specific and that has caused many problems. So when can we adopt a federal climate law based on a norm as the Commerce Clause? The Commerce Clause is fundamental. What we need to have here is a fundamental um, as a uh, fact, and uh, the government uh, or the state, they need to adopt a certain legislative base. Then in implementation systems, we have um, different issues, different areas, and we need to see what is the solidity, uh, how solid we want it to be. In the UK, ministries are easily changed. Uh, we have had a trend uh, to um, limit the climate change uh, ministry, and that was merged uh, with the 
um, and with energy and inter um, and finance. In Brazil, there has been a trend to avoid this Ministry of the Environment, and it depends on the government um, in power. And so, give an existence in the in a ministry. In in uh, give the existence of the ministry part or making it part of the uh, constitution. Well, that is uh, helps for protection, protection, and the uh, um, env environmental forum is also Chile. An Ch China has an environmental forum. India has an environmental forum. And the state has also um, considers this as, an, as a very complex issue. So an environmental forum, for instance, in Australia, certain federal states, the environmental forum has developed a lot of internal in, um, legislation. So therefore it could be a useful instrument to help develop the structure of competencies as well as content. So the three components need to be harmonized. Now, if we see the structuring plans, well, I think this is a checklist that we can observe, we can see from the constitutional point of view, and uh, we need to see what are the major aspects, those that have been covered, those that have not been covered, those aspects that um, have not uh, or partially been covered, and that has to be part of a debate. Now, if I go into deep, if I see what is the model? What is the economic model? Or rather, how the economic model has to be developed? Well, with the environment um, issue, well, this is complex. This starts um, in the 70s. This is an issue that starts in the 70s. Sustainable development is a vague a concept. And in a simple way, if we understand constitutional uh, process needs to analyze that factor. And for me, it's important to keep this in mind. Whatever the uh, solution that could be given there or the attempt of solution, the relationship between environment, social development, economic development, there should always be synergies. It is important to see that these conflicts and these synergies, they need to be solved. Therefore, there is a certain level of relation and what constitution does is to present a sort of a guide and try to give the judge or the legislator or even the executive power, the government, all the elements so they can create a hierarchy. For instance, a hierarchy in environmental protection, economic development, and all these conflicts and, and, and issues that we see um, that prevail and um, environmental policies as COVID policies, uh, social development, social environmental protection, there are cases where um, the pro environmental protection goes beyond uh, the social uh, economic development. If there are synergies, they could be partial, they could be integral. We're talking, uh, some have talked about green, inclusive green economy. Inclusive green economy is an aspiration. And um, environmental issues, if, if we uh, sometimes, uh, avoid an environmental problem, we might be creating another one. So all this for a constitutional norm, constitutional norms should know and the assembly should know that whatever the scenario, it is necessary to fill, to cover the whole field of conflicts. We will see conflict. How to cover all that? How to cover all that? Well, what constitutions do is simply point out a general direction with an inclusive economy, integrated economy in different terms and uh, create a, a sort of a guide to clear conflicts. 
This is important because it's going to close the environmental area and externalities, and that would be uh, simply the death of the environmental protection. We can talk about that later. A third element, a third element of the structuring plan in my presentation is the element of international law. And uh, we might think that uh, distribution of competencies, contents, structure, implementation structure, or even the economic model or the relationship, all that will be developed and defined only by the constitution. But uh, international law plays a major role and, and um, it might go into conflict. So, sorry, I've been talking too much. I will speak slower now. Uh, that has created many, many conflicts. Um, and also some uh, claims and uh, juridical claims, commercial issues and um, political issues, free, uh, free trade agreement issues. I describe this in this slide as something quite simple. The orange line is in a way the aspects that regulate international law. And the blue lines are those that uh, regulate internal rights. So as you see, uh, the international right penetrates deeply into these and the uh, constitution. This is something that needs to be taken uh, in consider into consideration. We have had many surprises in the European Union, Canada, Australia, uh, Germany, Spain, many countries of OECD, they have found um, litigation that are very important and um, trying to develop a system of uh, energy transition or ecologic transition. So structuring this um, at this level is something that, uh, well, we need to take into account the investment tre treaties, this is something we have been working on. I have been working on for over 15 years and, and, um, and uh, we can deepen into that if there are questions. Well, this is the framework, the structuring framework of the constitutional pr um, process. We need to consider these three areas. Now, from the point of view of perspectives, and this is my conclusion, and if we go to the first uh, area, in general, the three components, the role of the constitutional norm in the structuring of the juridical system, which is sophisticated, and it has a number of elements that should be considered. The Constitutional Assembly should maintain them, complete them, or reject them. But they have to be considered because this is something that has been considered in different other constitutions. There are many aspects there. And beyond the environmental competency, the um, certification of other competencies. And as I was saying, due to the importance of international law, negotiation and renegotiation on international treaties, as it has been mentioned in the um, uh, European um, Law, there is a constitutional mandate to the um, Commission to negotiate the agreements. Investment should include uh, chapters on that. Structure number two, structuring contents, principles, environmental, clear environmental principles, rights, rights and duties, the general duty and juridical base that are not only enablers, enablers, and a constitutional guide. And that has to consider the constitutional assistance and environmental forms. This is in general, 
This is in general, and uh, hopefully we can talk about all that in further detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. And um, this was a general vision, and that generates uh, many questions, and um, there are many concerns in the seminar. Um, you have clarified on the um, this concept and, um, and commerce clause and specifically how to regulate the commerce between foreign countries and states, and environmental law and um, constitutional law. And um, this in compared experiences and um, taking other bases that are not constitutional, that are not constitutional in Chile, in Chile, um, they want to, it's like saying, well, they want to put everything there unless it's more is not being applied in Chile. And um, as you said, that a map of the size of a city is less useful than a small map. And uh, this is something that we should do and it has to be structured. And this is very interesting. We could see this in the Q&A of what has been developed in the juridical framework, international juridical framework. We met many years ago talking about foreign investment and how the foreign investment plays a role here, a real role here, and um, also the potential controversies. And um, through these conflicts, regulation, and um, also in renegotiation, renegotiation and the possibility of renegotiating the international agreements uh, depending on the results of the constitution. So um, in general, the voice is, well, has to be um, focused on the results. And uh, it is fascinating. And we think that many of the subjects that we wanted to talk about are here today. So what we want to do now is to move towards a specific discussion a specific discussion of what we have in Chile. And uh, we need to have this full broad uh, framework of how this should be structured. And um, what are the, um, how it has been worked through in different um, areas. Uh, well, we have Dominique Hervé, um, a professor in environmental law and policy of uh, Universidad Diego Portales, uh, Dominique, uh, is uh, helping us to tell us where this discussion is, where's the environmental discussion. And um, also you're one of the commissions and um, about the environment, um, the right uh, to environment. And um, what we have here is the discussion, the environmental discussion will be uh, or will be going beyond what is uh, happening in that uh, committee and in the whole convention. So Dominique, uh, welcome, if you could help us with that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian, for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel and uh, with the interesting panel members in Chile and our um, uh, uh, colleagues in uh, Chile, it is a great honor to have you all here. And uh, we have the great opportunity to comment um, what is happening in the constitutional debate in Chile in the environmental area. And um, one of the commissions, the, um, the um, Constitutional Commission is to debate and put standards. And um, we need to uh, reaffirm is that uh, the environmental issue is, uh, has been one of the most uh, transversal issue in the debate at the convention. And um, out of the seven commissions, they have all debated in a way or another on all the relevant issues that have been 
discussed in the Constitutional Convention. And uh, it has also happened that there are some other controversial issues, environmental issues in the Commission of the Environment when where they have been debating and they have not reached and they have uh, reached a um, decision about that. And um, also the uh, rights of nature. And these have been some of the most complex um, issues, complex and controversial within the Commission of the Environment. And uh, they have not reached a decision yet. They have uh, decided that on the Commission of the Environment, but there were other commissions that recognized this before the Environmental Commission. So the um, Declaration of Principles and that it manifested that nature has right, that nature has right, and the Commission of uh, Fundamental Rights established that nature is, um, uh, is the bearer of rights. And um, they cleared that controversy in other commissions and not in the Environmental Commission, and that did not reach that decision yet. And they did so, and with this background from the other commissions. An important character that crosses over all the subjects that as a first characteristics, I would say. The other characteristic I'd say is apparent, I think, is that in this constitutional debate on the environment side, there's a change in the paradigms on the environmental Chilean law. Chilean law, environmentally speaking, as in many uh, uh, law is anthropocentric, is strongly anthropocentric, and it existed a relationship of the human being with the nature that is marked by the interest of the human beings and uh, becomes the utility. So constitutional debate generated a change in the paradigms in transit to an, from environmental law to ecological law, which is in the language that we use in the way in which we use nature before environment, which is something that already reveals some content or approach in regards to what we want to say in the Constitution. On the other hand, the Chilean state as ecological state, which reflects this change of paradigm that we want to incorporate in this new constitution. And of course, evidently recognizing the rights of nature in a very important way in several commissions that generates this change in regards to the approach that we would like to give to this uh, constitutional proposition to the environmental law in Chile, which have been then the main subject or environmental content that Professor Binuales was referring to, which are part of the debate in the convention. Some of them already sold and included in the final text of the constitution. Others are still in the debate in the different commissions of this convention. First, then I would say a key subject of this discussion has been acknowledging the rights of nature, which was a controversial subject, particularly I, it attracted my attention as it was eventually not that hard to be approved at a constitutional level as it was recognized in a fast way in some commissions that were not the commission of the environment. Then they installed the concept of the rights of nature in a fast pace in the environmental debate of the convention. And this has been included as a proposition in the new constitutional text. And evidently there's the influence of the right uh, of the law, law in Latin America to include the recognition of the nature law and nature rights in the constitution. And I think it has been a fundamental environmental thing in the debate of a commission as a state that in the shape of a state, they discuss the distribution of the territories and the competencies of the territorial entities. In these, we have established, I don't know much 
of the detail of this discussion around territorial entities, but it is attracting my attention that the territorial entities that have been declared autonomous regions and communes, they all have protection for nature and strong norms to protect the environment. So I think that in terms of skills distribution in the form of the state, we are showing a relevant change in the environmental law in Chile. And we could drill down into some aspects of the competencies distribution that could be probably complex to be implemented. I would say, let's say in these territorial entities, the competencies in terms of instruments of uh, decontamination, they have been the central competencies of the Ministry of Environment in Chile. There are other aspects like the administration of protected areas, which in agreement to this constitutional proposition, stays in the regions. And that could also cause some conflict of competencies while implementing this uh, system to protect the areas. On the other hand, and in this importance as part of the territory to be protected that defines or characterizes our country. The other that has been one of the structure points of a constitution, environmental speaking, I mean, I think that to my knowledge, it, they are in the norms of the constitution with important environmental principles like uh, progressiveness, precaution, environmental justice, climate, fair action, which probably as a principle, if we compare it, is a novelty as they put together the climate ambition together with environmental justice. So I think it is a very interesting in principle that could require development later to understand the content. And again, there's a principle that they obey to different, um, like compared law, if we think about good living as a principle in the constitution, recognizing the change of part I might explain, which is the relationship between the human being and the natures that are different from what we have now in our law. It is important to recognize environmental democracy, which has been part of the environmental commission and they have right to participation and information without recognizing immediately access to environmental justice. So I think that the access to environmental justice is discussed in the Commission of Justice Systems. Probably in that commission, then they will guarantee that right and is not expressly said in the recognition of environmental democracy, which is really uh, important as one of the pillars of the environmental democracy. On the other hand, I think that one fundamental aspect of the discussion has to do with the do, duty of a state in which they need to protect nature and the configuration of it. The discussion has been the state that is the custodian of nature, a state that goes beyond just the administration, but a state that needs to safeguard nature to be kept in its integrity for the interests of the future generations. This particularly is a figure that obeys to the influence of compared law, particularly North American law through the public trust doctrine, which has been uh, what they want to incorporate in the constitutional debate with an adaptation to the legal system in Chile, but that comes from the public custody of a state that is the custodian. That uh, custodian state has been mixed with other discussion that has to do with the common good. Common good in nature is part of the discussion of the Environmental Commission. Uh, 
And it has been a very interesting discussion because they want to include in the legal system a category that is different from what we have in the goods of nature. In our law, we understand public good or public good to be used in which the state will manage and be entitled to it and the private goods where the holders are private. This common good idea and nature common goods are part of the debate as an idea that is goods that are not even public, not even private, and in practical terms, they are not subject to be owned. And what they said is that the lack of ownership. So that discussion was changing. This has been really a fast discussion. We need to know when we analyze this is very few months to debate. So they cannot get deeper enough into the understanding to arrive to certain norms that are approved for the constitution. Common good, this was solved yesterday, I mean, or maybe Tuesday or Monday. Then it is approved common good category, which is not something that you could be subject to ownership, but the proposition was a definition and that proposition wouldn't go to the constitutional text. They just number a list and they say the ones that are not subject to be owned, the state uh, have certain uh, rules for different sort of goods, the ones that could be subject of ownership and the others that are not. Interesting, but not getting deeper in enough to understand in full what is the scope and the effect of these norms that are proposed for the Constitution. On the other hand, the climate change has been a relevant subject, not generating conflict, and it is included as a state that needs to adopt measures for mitigation, adaptation, and facing vulnerabilities of climate change. Particularly, it is relevant how the international cooperation is included as a fundamental element. In we have had the debate on the fundamental right of the balance um, environment, which is not controversial, so no discussion to impede that. This is the Fundamental Commission and in the Justice Commission, they discuss about uh, safeguarding environmental tribunals, uh, the defense of nature, and also an environmental institution where the fundamental discussion has been if we could give them autonomy or not as an environmental agency, which is an interesting thing that crosses over several matters, not just environment, which is the autonomy of some agencies. This is my overview of the environmental subjects. As you know, it's not really well structured, not systematic, not a conversation that is crystal clear between the commissions, but all of them faced the subject and included somewhat different norms that are referring to protecting nature and environment. So we need to see what this new constitution means in environmental terms. Thank you very much. Dominique, thank you very much. As uh, Jorge said, going back into the discussion in Chile, the snapshot is extraordinary. And evidently, and so far, we are in the process. And the first conclusion is that the discussion goes around everywhere, not just in the environmental commission, but is spread all about in the political system of fundamental rights, justice, etc. It's so interesting to see how it will, or it could come to an end with different uh, rules. I think it's so important what you said about the paradigm change, the 
policy in Chile is anthropocentric. I think today we're moving into what you said from environmental law to ecological law. We use nature instead of environment. And then we go back to the Q&A to the substance and how you move around on different subjects and you highlighted the right of nature and the law or nature law and the implementation of it. We maybe need to learn about the whole experience, the North American experience distributing the competencies and how the environmental protection of the United States is uh, a state protection, federal protection, and the way they order that is the Supreme Court. I'm talking about the United States. So lots of experience on that, but eventually also the subject of a common natural good and hopefully how you close that discussion. So thank you again. We will be back with our questions, but I would like to now go to Ricardo Irarazo, assistant professor from Pontificia Universidad Católica, the director of the environmental law program at Universidad Católica. Apart from the academic experience, he has been in important political positions, environmentally speaking, under Secretary of Environment, Executive Director of the Service for Environmental Assessment in Mining. So come on, your past is your backpack. So hopefully you could refer to these subjects we mentioned, particularly natural resources and the way in which you made progress in this commission of natural resources and environment in the Constitution. Well, Christian, thank you very much for this presentation. I'd like to say hello to all the panel members, especially Professor Buñuelas, Rainer, Veronica, Dominique, come on. This is a snapshot that you said, Christian. This is yesterday's snapshot. And today you were adding what was approved, what was not approved. This goes so fast and is, of course, challenging. And it's challenging because it prevents us from looking at the big picture and we stay in the details that are so specific in this discussion. So it is very interesting what Professor Vinuelo said. How can we see from the outside a structure that allows you in this individual interest or the collective of nature? Uh, when we look from the outside, we talk about discussion and the structure of the discussion, especially in natural resources. I think that the key event was said by Dominic is like the starting point of all this discussion, which was that there's rights for nature in the environmental commission is not just environment, it's environment and nature rights before it was approved. So the initial view was very clear to face it from the environmentally and from the ecological. So as Christian said in the translation of the change of paradigm, so it is key how this initial logic disseminated all this constitutional discussion. We might think that it's so local, individual or collective, and there's no coherence of some with others. There's a lot of coherence in the nature rights and is part of the principles commission. It's part of the fundamental rights and the environmental commission. So the challenge is let's apply a structure as Professor Bernal says to the constitutional process. If this structure is replicating international models, this has been part of these contexts. And we need to remember that in regards to the nature rights this specifically is said, what is the right of nature, which is the right to exist, which is a fundamental right. The right to existence is absolute, does not allow tolerance of risk. It's such a fundamental thing, is existing. So it is not a symbol element, not symbolic, but a structure in these constitutional discussion, that on one hand, but specifically in subjects of 
natural resources. The discussion is such a recent one as it was not analyzed from the Environmental Commission. And recently it was published as a report that will be taken to the plenary tomorrow. So still we need a final definition that could be set tomorrow in the plenary. Veronica will talk later about the water rights, but in regards to minerals, of course, there are fundamental changes that are not yet approved by the plenary and there's no any more mining concession, but an authorization, which is not so-called a permit, not subject to ownership. Mining will be forbidding inside of some areas of the country with the obligation of restoring in full is not the logic of risk evaluation is restoring is go back to the previous stage which is a specific for mining generating a reserve of the state which is a novelty when it is non-metallic reserves to enable authorization to metallic substances and in regard to these authorizations compared to mining concession are temporary they don't have the ownership and it's just an authorization so it is justified for the public interest is not obliged and it's subject to certain uh, possibilities of uh, legal actions and this is really re relevant for mining and the mining business and the long-term investment and what it means for the companies and stability and the real incentive for invent investment but in practical terms if we are consistent with the logic of the rights of nature well that's the result we need to apply it to economic activities we won't have private interest but public interest and a series of regula regulations if we try to apply what the professor said, we could see two options. And that is what is the environmental competency, transversely speaking, versus a constitution with bias in which you take one line, one line of interpretation and what happens in subjects on the evolution to the future. So I evidently, uh, go for one option, which is distributing the com competencies and the way in which we include the environment in the economic things and social things at a very transversal level in the state apparatus. So the essence of this project is the nature rights, not the logic of distributing them as an element that crosses over all the constitutional level, which generates tension and conflict which are not solved by the constitution and obviously will generate uncertainty big uncertainty what is the first the nature rights or the people's right is this the ecological rights first or uh, human access to water why have they avoided the sustainable development in the discussion what about the model which is not Chilean, but the Ecuadorian is including sustainability, but in the convention, they are kind of imitating the neoliberal model. Well, they replace the common good for good living. And they generate such a stress at a constitutional level on how they could solve the subjects as there was not an strict possibility of including sustainable development. As Professor Binuales says, the emphasis on the economic side, on the social or in the ecological side, which somewhat will mean that the government exercises authority, but not including it only in the fiscal theory, because it is similar to in the sustainability of the neoliberal model and in natural resources, that massively were used in compared constitutions is the rationale use of nature. And we were not seeing that being talked because that 
happens for nature rights. What about environmental compensation? Would they allow that? When uh, it's about water and air, carbon bonds, will they issue that? Constitutional Commission, they need to reconcile a discussion about carbon bonds. What about environmental management? Is that allowed from that per perspective when the nature has rights? In practical terms, the Chilean case, it has been unique at a world level, despite of the fact that the constitution generates to the nat nature rights, something that is established at, as a legal level, as we have seen in some, in some cities, truly impregnating this biocentric view that could be taken at a level of a state. So nature per se generated or impregnated the full discussion of the constitution. And that is something that the harmonization constitution still needs to check in this constitutional review, uh, importantly, because of how can they include sustainability from the logic of environmentally uh, inclusion, but principles, not just environment, but economic and social. Eventually, what we see is two environmental systems for protection. One system for protection, which is approved at a national level based on sustainability, despite of the per se nature protection, a system of protection that is based on the nature rights and all the norms that are consistent with the nature rights in regards to existence. And I think that is a major challenge. And one of the great contributions is uh, to include them in the nature rights up to sustainability and the conflict that will be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. It's fascinating. And um, this, well, uh, we, we asked you to make some futurology because uh, of what is coming and what because what uh, it has been commented before, these are things that uh, they already talked about, but may, we were asking you to project this. So concerns are evident, concerns are quite clear. You took us uh, to the fundamental area and um, everything uh, regarding this uh, concept and um, what it has to do with the development of the mining activity in Chile. And uh, the um, economic activity. So I will take that to the options of a constitution that is going to be an ecological constitution, but uh, how to develop that, how to um, do that and uh, incorporate the environmental issues uh, with the economic activity. There are concerns and uh, yes, yes. This is something that we need to take, we need to consider how convention will move forward. We will go now to a third panel. Um, very happy to have Veronica Delgado the first uh, teacher from the University of Concepcion. And that's where I studied uh, too, Veronica. And um, teacher of uh, law in the, in the faculty and um, environmental and water. And would like you to tell us about the discussion and the reform of the water rights. We have, were talking for 11 years on that and um, it's been a very important uh, reform to the uh, water code and, the, and uh, the exercise continues. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am very happy for this invitation. Be able to share this um, opportunity with uh, so many pre prestigious uh, scholars. Of course, water had to have an important role and it will be the first constitution um, approved after, after the Paris Agreement. Um, Chile is highly vulnerable to climate change. Drought is uh, 
for over 13 years in the country and it will continue in accordance to what experts say. Uh, rivers are uh, drying and um, the underground um, waters and with that all the ecosystems that depend um, um, on this. And uh, in Chile, we have hydric scarcity. There has been a lack of water. There has been a poor management. And this is not uh, because of the, or due to the government or the state, because it has not had so many tools and information uh, for that. In Chile, we have a private self-management system and um, we have had an, an, an international report that they make, they only make decisions um, uh, areas where they have no water rights. And the code, 1981, well, we don't have a priority use for water. And it's the only OECD country that has not integrated management of the water basin. And um, it has developed many uh, issues, it has uh, led to many issues, many claims, and many communities nowadays, they are, they are not having access to water, they don't have access to water, and, and versus other um, institutions that do have water rights, uh, some as mining in agriculture, agriculture, which is the highest consumer of water, they don't need to go into the uh, environmental impact uh, studies, they're not obliged uh, to do any review or, or on, the, on those um, uh, resources. And um, they recently recognized the human right um, to water, to access water, and the Supreme Court has been applauded but also been criticized. It has been criticized because it has been considered an activist uh, being part of public policy. 100 liters per second. Um, and it has been criticized that the rulings from the um, court has not imposed anything on to the mining companies because of the water rights, the Constitution 1980 guaranteed uh, this is um, guaranteed that water. And even though constitution allows from 1980, the um, owners of a house or a water rights, and in they base themselves to the environmental uh, heritage. Well, they um, did not consider that uh, before. They gave the water rights in a perpetual way without respecting the minimum ecologic flow, without um, considering any other areas and allowing the um, water water market, which is controlled, but it exists, still exists. And in Chile, as I say, that water is privatized, is it becomes a commodity, our civil code, uh, since 85, that was um, uh, written by Andres Bello, qualified water as a, um, a public use, uh, public asset. But we lost that coherence when the Constitution of 1980, they gave property over the water rights. And then the legislator in these years did not establish an obligation to these um, owners, and um, they wanted to reform the code and in 2005. It was tremendous. And everything that was approved back then was considered inconstitutional because it affected the um, property rights of the owners of the, of the water rights. And um, that implies that water conflicts were important in the uh, social uprising and that the issue of water was key for choosing cons um, members of the cons uh, Constitutional Assembly and uh, also the indigenous representatives. And it explains why the issue of water has not been discussed in one commission. 
but in many commission and in fundamental rights. And um, what's strange and paradoxical is that this is being carried out without understanding the reform of the water code and with the same constitution. And after 11 years of difficult reform, many of these changes, many of these changes were achieved. In the reform of the water code, they have concessions, concessions, and they will be um, concessions for a maximum of 30 years, and it makes the old rights and the new rights to respect the human right of access to water, and um, an authority can limit the exercise of those rights for the defense and prioritization of the water rights and the ecosystemic use. Conservation use are not going to be extractive in each basin. There will be um, hydro resources and, and also uh, will consider the opinion of the Ministry of the Environment. So the use of water uh, was environmentalized. And there are some pending issues. There are some are a bit polemic. Uh, well, some did not move forward in institutionality as they wanted to, as Professor Vignuales was saying, is to ensure an, an autonomous agency of water. Did not move forward towards the water code on management of basins and limited the market, still allowing that. And that is a problem for the constitution. And um, and there is a non-use patent that will be uh, for the water rights, and they were reserved for the state for the human resources. And um, when you see the draft of the new constitution where water is, we see that changes are stronger, even stronger than the water code. And in each uh, region, there will be um, an integrated management plan and they, they will have a sustainable use, respecting human rights and the rights of nature. And this goes in contradiction with the article that is going to be voted uh, tomorrow, where they don't give the approval to the basin, uh, but an organization, a specific organization on, on the water basin. And um, this was approved, uh, the, the draft went into the commission with over two thirds of the vote to recognize the water, the human right uh, to water. And um, that should not be met with, um, or that the desal plants should only be for consumption for, um, for mining use and leave surface water for uh, the community use. No, it's not, it's not considering that. And um, water, it cannot be uh, appropriable uh, or it, it is a public use and it is a common um, asset. And this common asset is a public trust and that should preserve it and, and restore it and invest in preservation, conservation and the uh, conservation of the basin and manage it in a governance, democratic, solidarity, which is something that is not happening with the users organizations and that the water code did not take, uh, did not take the, the chance of doing so and to defend that uh, the duties of the trust on water, there is a popular action and um, that we have a radical change. And in this radical change, it says that the um, status trust can only uh, give authorizations of use. And um, they are pointing out that an authorization could also uh, have the certainties of the concessions, interpreting them in a broad sense, and uh, on the standards approved in the Constitution, and I finish with this, these authorizations will be temporary. It was approved in the Water Code, 
and they are extinguishable and um, that could impose their obligations. And this is, um, is establishing that the uh, state can impose the, uh, the owners uh, an obligation uh, or the, the, the title bearers rather uh, can impose obligations to them. This is key. And they say they justify, they need to justify these obligations that are based on public interest. And there are more than 20 uh, norms on that, on public interest, protection, and what comes from the public trust in collective use. That is, the uh, bearers of the authorization, they need to respect public interest. And the state if the, or the government, if they want to impose obligation, they need to base their decision uh, on, uh, uh, on, on some reasons. And there will not be property of water. That means that uh, water is not, um, will not belong to an individual or um, an institution. And, um, and this is uh, totally different to what we have. So the questions are, these constitutional standards will affect the um, existing um, rights, the previous rights? Are they going to be expropriated if everything is going to be over of the water market? That's an interesting question. And these are things that we need to solve. And uh, we will talk about that. And many of these questions will be solved um, today. Uh, through the transient uh, rules um, in, that we will be touching on. Well, very interesting. And I know that um, this is before the Constitutional Assembly. And uh, having this in mind, um, there is a major reform and how much of that reform is being picked up in the constitutional reform and try to avoid re, uh, writing that, uh, rewriting um, um, what it has already been written. And um, the issue of water and how the regions and the territorial areas and the hydro conditions uh, the water conditions and the conditions where uh, water conditions of the University of Concepcion and um, the hydric conditions in the future are inexistent. So uh, the capacities are hydric capacities will be moving south due to climate change. So the territorial organization will be adjusted to that reality. All these thoughts are fascinating. We have 15 to 20 minutes to answer di uh, dialogues, questions. Well, this is so interesting. I'm, I'm so honored to have been able to listen to this conversation among these experts um, makes me wish that I had gone to law school when I was young instead of going to MBA school and economic school, but um, maybe I can make up for lost time. Um, I was especially struck by two of the phrases that came up repeatedly, and I had to listen to this in translation, so I'm not sure if I got all this right, but people repeatedly talked about rights for nature and people repeatedly talked about common good. And I have some questions about either each of those. And I think it's all really the same question. So on the on the rights of nature question, it's it's fascinating that that the Constitution is going to enshrine these rights for nature. But that's just the beginning of the conversation, right? Because once you establish that nature has rights to exist and they're fundamental and they're inviolable, as people said, um, it doesn't solve the problem because the, the the fish or the tree or the bear, he's like a kid, a, a child, right? He, he has rights, but he himself can't advocate for those rights. He needs an agent. He needs an advocate. And the question then becomes, who's the advocate? Is it the state? 
the state might be quite a an unreliable instrument, right? Is it any self-designated NGO? Would any NGO have standing to bring suit on behalf of the fish or the tree? It's super interesting. And I just don't understand how that's gonna work. So that's one question. The second question is about the common good, that there are certain goods like ore in the ground or especially water in the river that you can imagine as having, they, they contain public good and private good characteristics in the language I'm used to using. And you talk about them as common goods and you say, if you, if you create private property rights in those common goods, they'll get misallocated. But it could be that if you fail to provide property rights in those goods, they will be misallocated, right? Because the traditional way we create the incentives for the preservation of any asset is to allow somebody to own it and to force him or her to bear the short-term and long-term costs of its um, and benefits of its ownership. So I, I guess I don't quite understand why it makes sense to create what look like insecure private property rights, which have been a recipe for catastrophe in places like California, um, where they are the basis of water law and where water is systematically misallocated across uses and across time. So I'm, I don't know which of the four experts, any of whom is better qualified to talk about these things than I, wants to start addressing those questions. Thank you, Jorge. Fascinating. Dominique, I would like to ask you two things. Basically, you listed where Constitution is going. In general, is that Okay, or in a very shallow way is, what are your concerns? And both the, the, the ones that are going fine and the ones that you feel concerned, how, or how can we do? So these are not just statements. How can we make them more effective? Well, thank you, Christian. Particularly, in general, it looks positive, that change of paradigm. So that change, it seems to me that it goes in the right way. But not necessarily, I think that the norms that are being placed in that change are the best. But I do think that the change is something that I think will be favorable and it will be a benefit. In a way, what I think is fundamental and it has been very well recognized is principles. I think that clearly principles that are fundamental have been included in the text of the new constitution as a precaution, preventive environmental justice. I particularly feel fanatic of that principle of environmental justice. It's a principle that allows you to have an interpretation or a view, which is general in environmental law with an objective that includes the generations that are human in the present and in the future, but also nature. So it, it could be a lot sort of interpretations and regulations that could come later. I think so, because particularly the public custody of nature and the custodian state seems so interesting. The norm, particularly, I think, the one that was approved is not clearly achieving being able to state the duties of the custodian estate. I have faith and hope that they could be developed and interpreted in a way that is helpful for protecting nature. So I think we have some institutions that are being included, which will be well included and incorporated and eventually they will have interpretation and regulations, interpretation internally regulated that will be a change and a contribution for environmental law in Chile. Ricardo, a question that the public has been done. What is the estimation of the political cost and financial cost for the country? including contents and constitutional principles like the nature rights, when you consider the characteristics of the agreements of uh, trade agreements and the regulations that are uh, underwritten by 
uh, Chile, international norms. Wow, this is an analysis that has not been done on the convention, I think. In one thing in which I am critical about the constitutional entity, there have been some technical people, and when it is technical, it's like there's no arguments. And there's a lot more that we're missing in public policies and the results of the countries that are well ranked and in their ranks of environmental evaluation. I think it is a basic question as part of public policy, which is part of the norm, which is the effect in the social and economic things. And I think that effectively that was totally absent. And the project, in fact, in regards to the approved norms was very critical as I think that if we analyze what was approved, it's not experimental. In other parts of the world, there are countries that are better ranked in environmental things. We don't have the sustainability concept. The change of paradigm logic, it seems okay, but it not necessarily needs to go through the rights of nature, but uh, the duty of the state. The logic of nature rights is apart from the demand discussion for being legitimate, especially in Germany and the United States, being legitimate or popular action, if you want, it's okay. Let's see how can we solve this theme that is so specific. Ecuador constitution, which is the reference, is using sustainability and putting away the nature as a very symbolic concept that judiciary could be used for a specific situations. I think that if we try to interpret what this question aims for, which is the cost, if we include these subjects in international uh, lawsuits for um, foreign investment, for instance, uh, that has not been done. And I think it they don't want to do it. Okay, right. Oof, wow, we could be starting a new panel after these questions for these environmental norms and basically the international treaties with the legal system in Chile and how we could do it for the future. Jorge has exemplified uh, in, the, in Europe, which they do a better calculation compared to what we do in the chapter for sustainable development. Chile just negotiated the chapter that was uh, in regards to sustainable development because of the framework agreement that Chile is renegotiated with the European Union. Veronica, again, water. I was very interested to, in your presentation, what you said at the end, how the regulations that are water related, how they play with other norms that are part of this discussion. And if you can connect that with territorial um, part. I want to stop here. Sustainability. And what happens with environment that is replaced just by nature being put away. But in the draft, it is environment and nature in many of the norms. So it's strange that we are talking of two visions in many norms. What I want to tell you is that when we were discussing the economic models, France, and in their letter, in their carta, they were cited. One of the norms in France says we need to go to sustainability and all the sectorial policies need to aim to the same thing. And I said, wow, that is great as a norm for Chile. Many times environmental norms stay behind because the forest and agricultural policies and mining policies are not uh, obeying to the protection of nature and the environment. And it was rejected immediately because of referring to sustainability as if we need to obey to the sustainable principles as if they are not working together. It was a strong negation. What other norms are coming in water? In water, you see in territorial systems, 
we could say, why is this in the constitution? But the history leads to that. Reforms are always late and take so much. The convention wants to solve problems that took decades without the legislation and solve them now. First, a norm about the territorial order or systems for rural sites. We have planning for urban ground, but in rural ground, it's like the jungle law. You do whatever you want. And that will have a working unit for the territory order, the basin and the preferential use of territory for productive activities will be done if there's water or if there's no water. Consequently, this seems to be an important decision that we did not have. Then management integrate in an integrated manner of the basin. Since 90, that was the idea. So the norm is uh, really detailed about an organization of basins or plurinational organizations where all the users should be there, where we need to respect the priority use at a level of detail that we might not easily find in other constitutions, but they are explained by our history. And that will oblige to be defending in each of the region with territorial order, the highest part of the basin, wetlands, weirs, or uh, I mean, uh, springs, water springs, the creation of water agency as an autonomous organization that I already said, and Professor Vinuales said, let's make them feel secure in their institutions. We could criticize institutions and the World Bank said, why not an undersecretary on 2016, then the agency of the water in five years and then um, not part in the creation of the water ministry. We did no thing. Then the project was presented and we know that these took some delay with a great support of the less hard right center and left. The votes are there for a national agency of water as an autonomous entity, autonomous entity. We have 56 organizations that are competent in water, in water situations and the general director of the waters has no skills to do a good management of all that. These norms with such a detail are maybe explained by not being operative in the legal branch and um, executive branch that were hardly no solving this. Oh, I have to give excuses. There are several questions that will be not answered. We knew we didn't, we wouldn't have the possibility, but I think this has been a great introduction to the discussion that certainly we need to have again in a couple of months when we have more clarity about what is, what's going to happen in the regulation of the bill or project, I mean, of, of this uh, constitution. I would like to thank you, Jorge, for being with us. Uh, I know that you are almost uh, ready to be a father, to become father in these following days. And all the panel members in this discussion that I found is fascinating for us. Thank you very much for being from Cambridge also. And uh, we excuse to the rest of the people asking questions. We will be back soon in this same subject. Thank you very much to not just our headquarters in Cambridge, but David Rockefeller Center for Latin America in Chile. Harvard has got a very active office and Marcela Renteria, she's always available to work together in all these relevant subject matters. We have to say thank you to all of you. Please stay with us in May. We will be back with a webinar on constitution and we will maybe start talking about the first drafts that are the ones that are coming out. So please stay with uh, David Rockefeller Center and the dialogue of Harvard for the new constitution. Thank you very much. See you in the next one. Thank you. Thanks everyone.